जय हिंद वेलकम टू डेफ टॉक्स दिस इज आदि पाकिस्तान डीप स्टेट a lot is happening in pakistan even as we speak with the protests with the fight between the civil and government and the so called establishment within pakistan it is for us to understand who this deep state is where do they get get their money from how do they actually operate and what is their entire purpose finally a last question do they actually know what is good for them to discuss this entire paradigm i have with me left in general Dushyant Singh, PBSM, ABSM, a retired general from the Indian Army with a specialization in anti-terrorist operations and financing, a DIG, and then an IG with the with the NSG, a commandant of the Army War College, and an expert on strategic issues concerning India, and of course Major General Sudhakar Ji, VSM, an expert in India's border disputes with on the Eastern sector as well as our topic today, the Western. neighbor of ours former colonel of the mahar regiment a strategic writer a speaker on various issues concerning geopolitics and strategic affairs thank you both for joining me today for this very important discussion on the pakistan deep state jalal tushan sir i'd like to begin with you so one of the you know this is one of the few countries as i said uh, which mentions its deep state as the establishment to polish it up a little bit who are they what do they want what do they do and why are they there to be the biggest question oh well adi first of all uh, thank you once again uh, for the opportunity to speak to our audience on an issue which possibly in india most of us think that we know about uh, pakistan army has always been in the common security dialogue of our country so by and large most of us are aware uh, about pakistan and pakistan army as such you asked about deep state deep state simply means a government within a government i like to say as a government over a government so uh, the official government is always subservient to another establishment which actually control calls the shot which is a common knowledge with uh, most of us the as far as pakistan is concerned the pakistan army can be broadly considered as the deep state earlier the pakistan army used to rule directly and it realized that it used to get the brick bats for all the wrong things which happened in the country so of late especially after the uh, jan ziaul haqs uh, stint as the uh, as the pakistan's dictator for good over 7 to 8 years in the 80s they switched over 70s rather they switched over to indirect or proxy governance which nowadays people call as hybrid go- governance in which the face of the governance is the the elected of elected uh, people or uh, ele- elected elected government of the day but actually the 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 cherry is shared by both it's a symbiotic relationship between the pakistani army and the political establishment which comes to power the mechanization of controlling the political establishment by the pakistan army is what the deep state does of pakistan hmm. and part of this deep state of pakistan is the pakistan army itself which has deputed the isi as its primary organ to conduct this kind of an operation which is an internal manipulation as well also uh, an external manipulation through proxy wars so both these jobs are handled by the isi and to support the isi it has the mullahs and the mujahids as i call it as so the triple m consists of the pakistan's deep state that's a very simplistic way to understand what is the deep state of pakistan interesting sir but uh, just dr ji would you like to add something to this before i you know come to my question to you uh so mentioned that it's the three ms that actually come down to you know handle this particular thing uh what is the significance of the biggest you know of the three ms that's the military 
<clears throat> Firstly, Adi, good evening and thank you so much for having invited me for the Dev Talk the second time. And I thank you for having chosen this subject and thank uh, General Dushan for having uh, enlightened me. To be very honest, I was absolutely ignorant about this, but uh, I have learned a lot under Duris. By virtue of the questions you have framed beautifully, there are certain issues which I wish to share right at the outset. And thanks to General Dushan having uh, thrown light on the very important, uh, put the primer, <coughs> applied the primer on the canvas. Uh, first and foremost thing is, uh, firstly, the creation of Pakistan, before we come to the three M's. The creation, because history plays a very important role. Uh, was it by a doctrine of necessity that the deep state, because more literature I studied, more actually the name of Turkey came, kept coming up, getting thrown up. But one thing which stood out is what General Dushan has actually highlighted, is that um, domestically, the military is taken as a role model for the Pakistani people. Unfortunately or fortunately, the birth of Pakistan has taken place on broken grounds, not on very stable paradigms. And when I say broken grounds, what it means is that the, there are a few legacy points which have actually passed on uh, right from, <clears throat> I would say, uh, um, the India's National Congress. And when the act was passed, uh, that is 1935, followed by the Independent Act of 1947, if we go deeper into these two acts, we would realize that uh, intrinsic in these two acts are uh, two important issues. First and foremost is the strong centralizing tendency. Example, the governor general in both these acts had been given excessive powers, emergency powers to appoint or dismiss, dismiss any minister at his discretion. Second point, which actually is got thrown up, uh, which I understood was the during the colonial era, West Pakistan experienced uh, dictatorial tendencies, an authoritarian form of administration uh, in comparison with the rest of the British Empire. These two points actually highlight the British Raj. Uh, this is the legacy point. And second most important point, which I wish to highlight, you may like to add the fourth M to your three M's is the, the Muslim League. The Muslim League, <clears throat> conceptually without going uh, too much into detail, uh, they somehow could not uh, you know, mobilize the larger community until mid-40s. What they used to do, they used to elect the representative, people's representative, not elect, they used to select a person and ask the people and the activists to support the person. So this, rather than a bottom-up approach of a, a democratic process of uh, electing a leader, it followed a, a different method which actually gave way to a kind of uh, uh, authoritarian kind of uh, dictatorship. The third is the partition. Partition, people who have carried out research on the subject, it actually threw up a very important point um, that post-partition, the capital of Pakistan was Karachi. Karachi did not have any locus <clears throat> of a capital state, of a government, and the institutions are weak. They are thinly staffed, very few people to actually man the offices. Um, Hence, uh, uh, these kind of things have actually uh, been taken as fault line in the system. And one important point is somehow, uh, when I read through, it did not gel too well in my mind. Uh, it came out that uh, many Pakistanis, they feel that India does not accept Pakistan as a separate state. So this is all theoretical knowledge which I have gained over the past couple of days. I haven't uh, been able to internalize like General Dushant and you. So what they expect as per their expectations, they, pers they still feel that perhaps India is going to undo this partition process sometime sooner or later. This is the kind of feeling which I have gathered from my reading. And the fourth point which stood out in my study in the past couple of days is the leadership crisis. Jinnah, he died on 11th September 1948 unexpectedly. And Liaquat Ali Khan was assassinated on 16th of October. So very at the beginning of the independent country, which is taken birth in 1947, in just about one to two years time, the, the primary leaders, the important leaders passing away, created a void 
or vacuum could not be filled up and this led to political instability and chaos in Pakistan. And this chaos, and there could not be any consensus that could be emerged or developed in the idea of Pakistan. Like uh, if you read that book of Stephen Cohen, the idea of Pakistan, he brings out beautifully idea of <clears throat> Pakistan, somehow it did not have a consensus. And by and by what happened was in 1958, when the constitution uh, collapsed, um, the martial law was imposed by Mirza, by General Mirza, and uh, subsequently that also was uh, dismissed by Field Marshal, then General Ayub Khan, 1958. And thereby he set a precedence of military uh, command uh, coming, making inroads into the political domain. Uh, last but not the least is the India factor. Uh, since partition, Pakistan has suffered from the feeling of vulnerability and inferiority complex with India. And um, um, uh, the, the initial war with India in 1948, uh, there were lots of internal discord with the provinces, the mounting fears that the partition will be undone by India and such like issues. And there are many other factors to save time. I'm just cutting it short. This actually compelled the founding fathers to invest heavily into defense at the cost of other institutions. And in the process, the state building, the, um, uh, they exercised uh, much more energy and effort and uh, resources on national security um, uh, rather than focusing on civil liberties and rights of its citizens. These are a few highlights I thought initially I'll share this in addition to what General Dushwan had said, so that the canvas gets well primed and set for the uh, discussion to follow. Thank you, sir. I think the national security state and its formation and, you know, the single unit nation state sort of a thing, I think you've brought that into perspective. General Dushant, I'd like to ask you, sir, one thing that really baffles me about this whole situation and this whole so-called deep state or the army or, you know, the establishment or there are 15 other names that people use is whatever activities these guys are doing damages their own country. Uh, one knows that they are going to be in power till the time the crown jewels are there with them, which are the nuclear weapons, which is fine, fair enough. But it's still damaging them. The you know uh, the terrorism or whatever you look at, whatever activities that have done, it's damaging. Is it that they don't understand what they're doing, or is it just that the factor that they've gone so far ahead in this whole charade that they just don't have a choice anymore? Well. Um... Adi, uh, as far as uh, uh, this issue about knowing fully well the implications of uh, undertaking activities which the Pakistan army does and its uh, uh, major handle DGISI does uh, in terms of uh, articulating internal and external uh, politics is probably you know, a later on realization. Uh, you must realize why the ISI, why the deep state came into existence. Well, uh, as far as background goes, yes, the Pakistan army uh, started this process of military rule right at the time of independence after the death of Gyatat Khan, as, as uh, Sudhakar has said. But the, the actual birth of deep state started after the loss of Pakistan and splitting of Pakistan into two in 1971. Hmm. Pakistan lost total credibility in Pakistan. Its reputation was at Nadir. If, if you really look back at history, the only civilian government which actually enjoyed the power of a civil governance was the government led by Bhutto after 1970. All the land reforms were undertaken during Bhutto's time. The, the, the colonial social contract got uh, adjusted or got rectified during Bhutto's time. It was then that the Pakistan army realized needs to create an alternate, unstable kind of a Pakistan civil polity, which should toe the line of the Pakistan army and slowly Pakistan army should get into the central position. And then exactly that's what happened. Ziaul Haq, who was 
superseded by uh, Bhutto to promote him as the chief of the army yeah. staff, yeah. Took, over, uh, took over the reins of Pakistan. And during his tenure, they started building young leaders, young civilian leaders who would toe the line of the deep state. The first and the foremost was Nawaz Sharif. As a young student leader in Lahore, this man was slowly cult cultivated by the Pakistan army with the aim of taking over as the, as the uh, leadership of, of a civilian government. Subsequently, they have been playing between the PPP and the, PM, uh, and the uh, Nawaz Sharif's party, PMNL. It is when they realized that the binary was getting too strong that yeah. they propped up Imran Khan into the game. While they were doing this, they also realized that the existence of Pakistan army will only be secured if they have the ability to retain power directly or indirectly. Okay. For mm -hmm. that, what they started doing was spreading toxic nationalism. These, these compelling factors made them first articulate their internal politics, the, the idea of a two-nation theory, the need to regain their popularity by avenging 1971 defeat became the second primary driver of the Pakistan army for which they needed a deep state which could, without the control of the civilian government, interfere into okay. other countries and hence started the war of uh, the, uh, by Ziaul Haq bleeding India through thousand cuts. So the birth of deep state started during, actually in true sense, started during the general Ziaul Haq. And after Ziaul Haq, when he got assassinated, somewhere Pakistan army, in fact, the next chief announced, I will never, uh, it was, I think, Aslam Beg, who said, I will never take over uh, the, uh, the, the rule of uh, Pakistan. They realized that an indirect proxy is always better than a direct war. Ability to control the external environment must remain with them and also the internal environment. And hence, ISI was needed. Now, when they, when they created these elements within themselves, which could fight against each other, they get, they, they get out of control after a while. Correct managed somehow to remain above the water in a chaotic situation. But what is ensuring, what they are ensuring by this is that the Pakistan army always remains in the center. Gallup poll today also in 2017, Gallup poll says 84% people still believe that Pakistan army is the best uh, institution as far as mm. Pakistan is Although 64% also have said that they would like to have a democratic setup. Yeah. So they are just reflecting what the public of Pakistan is wanting. So chaos helps them to remain in the center. If everything is going well, who remembers the army? Tell me this. Stabilizing take, factor. Take for example, in our country, we are a well-settled democracy where things are decided by the people, for the people, with the people, right? It's not the case in Pakistan. <clears throat> this thing happens, then the Pakistan army, army will be sent to the barracks. It will be told to remain under control. I am sharing a very small example before I close my point. Uh, I was serving with a, with a Pakistan army colonel somewhere in the West, as part of my tenure uh, there. And I happened to ask him, you know, what is the status of Pakistan army there? He says, it is very simple. In front of Pakistan army's chief of army staff, there is a one and a half kilometer line for his darbar to address points. And in front of the prime minister's office, there are none standing. No common public stands there. Or if people who are there, they are just trying their luck out because they couldn't meet the Pakistan army chief. Where is the power? Where, is, where, is the, where are the people flocking to? 
it is this power which has which has been the prime motivator and anti india stance their desire in the, the the desire is there in the entire pakistan's public to get kashmir with them it is not something that uh, you know pakistan pakistani public doesn't want you read their history books the way they have been structured i have a whole list of issues how they have changed their history books of independent independent itself where people are still living and india has also done a little bit of tweaking i'm not saying that india has not done tweaking of its own history books both have done it but the pakistani side has done it blatantly blaming almost for everything on india in their history books to the children of first second third fourth standard so what will the mind of such people think even if the generations have gone by i don't buy that argument that you know a partition has gone by and the generation has changed no a very simple example partition pakistan blames it on gandhi india blames it on jinnah civil disobedience disobedience movement 1932 1936 pakistan textbooks do not mention about it yeah. whereas in india it is highlighted mm. of coming to people hindu muslims together so what i'm trying to say is both sides are to be blamed but the indian side was slightly more uh, nuanced in its uh, articulation of textbooks textbooks affect minds of young people mm. so the opinion has been generated very well in favor of pakistan army pakistan army to remain center state must have kept inside its country and therefore the isi's single bound aim to remain to continue to keep pakistan in a state of chaos so that they can be in power so they can be in power and if there are some frankenstein frankenstein monsters they will deal with them the way they dealt with them in north western frontier what did they do they used everything from tanks to aircraft to aircraft. i mean that's not the way you fight insurgencies or militancy we also have militancy in our uh, country but we have a me- we have a method in madness we fight it observing all uh, human rights uh, considerations before dealing with terrorists etc it's not the case with them so they they have the power and they, they deal with it the way they want to deal with it so therefore uh, they it is the, this idea of pakistan army remaining center stage that chaos is taken care of a chaos is created and then it is taken care of and then the public is said look if we weren't there this wouldn't have happened and same thing will happen to tariqul abbas also i think that's that's the punch line of it that you brought out so if we aren't there boss country nahi bachega aapka desh nahi bachega hum nahi honge to thank you general dushant for that uh, very very clear cut answer uh, moving over to you general sudhakar ji i want to ask you you know the army chief is actually decided by the prime minister we also have a situation where the same army chief sits down and dismisses the same prime minister where does the army chief get so much power is it just the barrel of the gun or is it something else thank you adi for the uh, lovely question you have asked uh, and to answer your question uh, a little uh, linkage i would like to establish with where general dushan finished off is it because of lack of e- effective and good governance uh, the army in pakistan uh, has a no justification available each time to justify as we all know that there have been th- three or uh, four coups military coups including the one which took place in 1953 the constitutional coup which actually gave out uh, gave a opening a standard opening in the constitution for military to come in any time required under the heading of doctrine of necessity this is an exclusive part which is there in the constitution and in fact this constitution as we all know kept on getting revised once it happened in 73 there after the 76 number of times okay that is one part second part is uh, also to answer your question i would like to take the mind of the viewers to 16th of september 16th of september we may be knowing may not be knowing <clears throat> there was a closed room meeting wherein the prime minister the opposition parties and the ruling party they were there inside the hall 
and along with so-called the deep state, the army and the ISI. Uh, officially, it has not been disclosed as to what was discussed, but things do leak out. What has come out is that um, the opposition was told in no uncertain terms that the military at no cost will be dragged into the controversy of election, oblique selection of the Prime Minister Imran Khan. I believe a lot of hala gula is taking place in Pakistan. The media is rife about all this issue. He is coming to power or having been selected, not elected, as Prime Minister is also being questioned by a very vital segment of population in Pakistan. So this is just an example I wish to give you. Perhaps this would answer your question, where lies the, the strength and who is the deep state? Yes, you have a point in the demo because we all have been up, brought up with a paradigm and orientation of democratic approach to governance. Hence, we know there is a hierarchy. Army is a ap political, but here is an army which has actually done military coup four times, and ready. And they say there are many unsuccessful military coups which have taken place. There are many number of examples. One example is Major General uh, Akbar Khan, um, who was actually leading the left wing quietly in a very covert manner. Uh, he was a leading act activist. So similarly, there are many more such kind of leaders who have attempted military coups, but not been successful. Therefore, the power actually lies with the army always and every time. That is all I have. Back to you, Adi. Uh, General Dushan can throw some light on this. I think a very succinct answer. So would you like to throw some light, sir? I think uh, this issue has been uh, well covered. As far as the appointment and dismissal is a story of uh, egg and chicken, I mean, ch egg and chicken in first, right? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but to uh, simply put it in, in a common man's uh, language, uh, as I had said earlier also, that uh, the civil polity has been propped up by the army itself, right? So dismissing it is not a major issue. As far as the uh, as far as the appointments etc are concerned, these are gone through to to portray a semblance of uh, governance that you know Pakistan is being governed by a proper government, right? Mm. If it starts directly interfering into, uh, if it is seen overtly as ruling the country, then it would that whole idea of indirect uh, or a proxy. Governance or a hybrid government will not uh, will not stand the ground of uh, you know test. You know, will not stand the ground. Therefore, people will go against the Pakistan army. So they try to establish as much as possible a semblance of civilian government. It is only that they, they decide to raise issues of corruption, etc., when they want the civilian government to fall off. Uh, I was reading somewhere that. There is a very simple thing which they do is that the civilian polity throws the money, wins an election, propped up by the Pakistan army. They both get together to rule, share the cake amongst each other, knowing fully well that their, their survival in the governance is contingent to the army's pleasure. And this is a very symbiotic relation, as I mentioned earlier also. And it is going on uh, post Ziaul Haq. I'd like to request both of you to actually just keep a small thing in your closing comments, sir. Is why is it that so many of these civilian leaders come with their, you know, with a sword on their neck and keep trying what they're trying to do? Uh, you know, I'd like to move on with this point, General Dushant. I'd like to ask you this, sir. Would you like to tell me, and and uh, instance where a civilian government actually upstates the deep state. Uh, you know, has there been an incident wherein the civilian government opposed it? Why I ask this is because again we see something like this happening uh, between Imran Khan and General Bajwa, as well as the fact that the ceasefire with India was also signed by the army. Uh, on the other hand, it has been upstaged by Imran Khan quite badly. Uh, you know, by all the name calling and all that stuff that he does. Uh, having said that, the control is still, of course, with the army and India is also dealing with the army directly. But again, an incident where the 
civilian government was able to actually upstage the deep state well uh, i won't say a classic case of upstaging by a civilian government as far as pakistan is concerned it has happened twice in the past where a civilian government has tried to assert itself over the uh, over the pak pak military uh, a recent example was benazir bhutto during her regime she had wanted somebody to be appointed as dg isi and the pakistan army wanted somebody else to be appointed as the dg isi bhutto was dismissed from the governance and that was the end of her assertion over the pakistan army before that her father when in 1971 the pakistan army actually lost credibility bhutto actually you can say seriously upstaged the military establishment of pakistan army uh, not directly but through the fact that the pakistan army had become so weak and so uh, so vulnerable that willingly automatically a civilian government with a leader of but of uh, zulfikar ali bhutto stacher could easily step into something i would say very close to jinna or uh, liaquat ali khan and ruled the pakistan uh, state for good over 4 5 years before uh, uh, zia ul haq had the courage and the gumsham to re- uh, first arrest him and then hang him. these are the two occasions when when the civil government was actually which had actually upstaged the uh, military otherwise in the pakistan's history uh, you will not see anything like this it is clear cut make money by both corruption is at the root of both army as well as the polity polity says the civilian polity says that i have got a chance let me make the maximum out of it what is happening to nawaz sharif I don't have to go through Panama Papers, etc., etc. I think a very clear, interesting example of uh, Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto that you've taken, sir. General Sudhakar ji, I'd like to ask you, sir. The Taliban seems to be one of those things that they've stepped on a mine. Um, you know, I, I'll go back to my previous, you know, one of my previous questions that I asked is. is it that they they know what they're getting into because the taliban is going to be harmful to that com- country why would they support this a group that will create havoc within their own country uh what is the reasoning of the deep state i mean you can see what's happening with the tlp you can see what's happening with the ttp there are daily attacks there are daily uh, coffins coming home uh of of pakistani soldiers i mean we in india are killing the terrorists but here are the soldiers dying themselves what is the reasoning behind uh, for this activity sir are they a very relevant question but uh, you know the realistic answer as well you see pakistan as a nation state has reached such a stage that the very concept of deep state is to my mind is irreversible i have finished off two three books in past seven days thanks to you and jalil dushan all the books are actually bringing out one hypothesis and that is the only way to actually take pakistan back to some rules based international order governance or some semblance of uh, good order is to have a social revolution very very impartial in independent judiciary a political military you know those like things you know and um, they have given example how pakistan can be brought back to the normalcy it is not a normal state so they have actually the water has gone beyond the level of nose to my mind pakistan is uh, doomed it is it is it is destined to be getting obliterated on its own unless some corrective measure not only by the hierarchy of the establishment or the civil government mm. or the military hierarchy it is by every individual in the pakistan nation state has to be aware and sensitized and they realize it has started happening the pakistan democratic front has started taking steps the pashtun front is actually making noises 
there may, there are so many uh, journalists who have been picked up uh, kidnapped and they have disappeared the baluchi liberation front is also making noise there are many other independent organizations of late this is happening between 2019 and now in past two years it never picked up momentum so much with so much of intensity in the past so perhaps perhaps to my mind i feel that uh, this creation of pakistan it will be the one the reason for destruction of pakistan same taliban will get back it will not slap it will actually make pakistan disappear from the map of world it may sound very exaggerated but things are happening that way without any exaggeration talk about tehreek taliban talk about the al qaeda the other day i read something very alarming i didn't know that isi has infiltrated people into its own people into isis khorasan five years back there are good number statistics are given there almost about 1500 people of isis and who are these people today one of my friends i am there in a panel discussion somebody by the name of dr mirza he is in exile in uk he is actually representing pakistan occupied kashmir they have given a slogan that pakistan has been told to vacate uk by 22nd october 2023 it's a building up the opinion is building when you talk to this gentleman he says all these things including the deep state it will stop uh, figuring anywhere or appearing but i have my own analysis and facts to support to save on time i would say that the, to answer your question directly um they are only playing to the gallery for survival mm. this is my short and sweetest answer uh, because today you know the statistics the fatf uh, has already imposed put that gray list on them one gray list for a quarter a quarter of a duration in a year this is happening quarterly earlier it is to happen six monthly if i am not wrong you know the impact the impact is 10 billion dollars which otherwise would have been flowing into pakistan will stop flowing in i am talking about the fii earlier it was fii as per my calculation in the year 2018 that's no, sorry 19 now i believe it is 10 billion has gone up to almost about 15 billion the requirement of pakistan as a nation state to survive per month is coming to roughly around 6 billions they don't have they they require almost to the tune of 51.6 billion dollars to for the debt servicing for next 3 years this is the kind of economic challenge they have the inflation is gone up the external debt has gone up the debt to gdp ratio is touching 100.3% 60% is for a normal state 100.3% debt to gdp is something like they are already with the begging ball imf world bank and the asian development uh, bank they all have declined to give any kind of aid or loan so therefore i would sum up by saying that there are no quick answers they are actually doing it basically the past is such the historical legacy is such that they cannot go back and reverse the trend they have to take they are on the other side of the hill coming back this side of the hill is going to be difficult that's i have uh, rest general dushan can take with us interesting sir i'd like to just uh, take a follow up with from uh, general dushan on this sir so you know general uh, sudakrishi mentioned about the financial situation that is ensuing in pakistan this is also a you know if i may use a very loose loose word the karni of the deep state it's not something that has been imposed onto pakistan so jaise karni waise bharni and you know the pakistani deep state isn't stupid and that's something that we realized over the past few years they've survived this long uh, they're not stupid they're not silly uh the civilian government is a whole another separate issue and the you know representatives of that is a whole separate issue how do you think they they landed themselves into such a mess that they they you know kind of just don't know where to take it forward after that uh see um, as far as landing themselves into such a mess is concerned uh that is a process where you deal with uh, shady elements you are bound to get into problems right if not uh, controlled uh, properly as far as uh, indian side is concerned as far as indian border is concerned i think they have managed the situation fairly well and they they retain the control but as far as the afghani side is concerned uh, they have not read the history themselves as well that's the way i look at it because the uh, afghanis 
have never agreed to the Durand line. That's point number one. So if they have not agreed to the Durand line, 26 million Pashtuns staying in Pakistan and 11 million on the other side, both the sides combined together wish to be together. I mean, I'm not talking in a very uh, specific term, but by and large, the sentiments are that the Pashtuns would like to have their own uh, separate uh, identity as far as uh, Pakistan, as far as Pashtuns are concerned. And therefore, Tariq Taliban Pakistan has an agenda and it will follow that agenda. In fact, uh, as they say, uh, enemies, enemies, your friend, they have started befriending Baluchistan. They have started be, uh, BLA, Baluch, Baluchistan Liberation Army. They have started befriending ETIM, uh, which is the Turkmenistan uh, militant group, which is against the Chinese. So therefore, Tariq Taliban Pakistan is playing its card keeping its own uh, interests in mind. Uh, yesterday only their talks failed with the yes. Afghanistan uh, Af Afghan Afghanistan uh, government where they were trying to re control the TTP's uh, actions and today their uh, their leader Gul, I'm forgetting the, uh, the, the some Gul Nazir or somebody has actually ordered attacks to recommence. Yes. So, so that is a situation which I call it as the Frankenstein monster which has been created and now it has gone out of control, right? Uh, I don't want to quote examples in our side, although we have done similar activities. Uh, one doesn't have to quote it here, but we all know about it. We have also yes. done it. We did it with a purpose, but that didn't uh, survive. That is one. As far as surviving this situation is concerned, they hold two, 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 two cards with them. And this is one reason why the countries will come to save Pakistan and it will not disintegrate. That's my way of looking at it. The first one is that Pakistan is a nuclear state. Right? <laughs> Since it's a nuclear state, it will, IMF will continue to give it, give a release uh, aid in, in small portions to meet its debt commitments. Mm. One. The second reason why it will survive is that Pakistan willy-nilly is now also being being taken for uh, taken as uh, as the mother of uh, all terrorist activities in the in the world. So therefore, most of the people would try to ensure that Pakistan remains stable, and government of Pakistan is able to control these terrorist groups so that their shores are not affected. Right? That is the second reason why Pakistan would. Uh, remain stable. And the third one is the higher than the mountains, higher than the Himalayas <laughs> and bears, which is China. Uh, China is also caught in a, in, in a kind of a bind where it cannot leave Pakistan now. Yeah. With so much committed now into Pakistan, now they have, I believe, shifted to Karachi because the Gwadar port is not actually giving them uh, the, the kind of uh, access which they wanted. So they are now trying to build up a proper port, uh, uh, another modern port in Karachi. So therefore, they would try to divert whatever they have, uh, traffic which flows, uh, sorry, the uh, trade which flows via Karachi port. So China has its, in, has its uh, commitment as far as Pakistan is concerned. I think these three major factors will ensure that Pakistan is made to remain uh, afloat and it does not sink into total chaos. Because if that happens, and if by chance the control of the nukes go to uh, hands which are not desirable, then I think the world itself will face problems. So the world realizes this issue. And the Pakistanis are also smart. You know, they have changed their uh, uh, nomenclatures of their proxy groups. Incidentally, TTP is not their proxy group, right? They have lost control of TTP. Yeah. ISI has lost control of TTP. Whereas LET, JEM, these, these groups are proper proxies of Pakistan and they are under their control. And they have now the mentioned, I mean, they have now re, re christened them as the resistance front in Kashmir, as you all know. That was to get over the FATF. Mm -hmm. That was just to get over the FATF so that the, yes, if the FATF had put them into a blacklist, then even that minimum aid which the the IMF gives would not have. The difference between the IMF aid and the Chinese aid is that the IMF aid is a very, very low uh, interest rate, one point some percentage, whereas whereas the uh, the Chinese is 3.6 commercial rates. It's huge. And the Chinese know that they can't pay, the Pakistanis can't pay. 
but they gave them because they are indirectly benefiting from the uh, access to pakistan mm. and they will take their pound of flesh whenever required through the procedures which they have got dead trap or whatever you call them but as of now the chinese are also a worried lot absolutely yes that is why they have demanded compensation for their workers huge compensation for their workers were killed the chinese workers were killed recently in the uh, attack by the tehreek e taliban pakistan from the pakistan government so chinese are not going to spare them as such but they will also not kill them it is i i keep saying that it's like the liquid oxygen ha huh? liquid jeene nahi dega oxygen marne nahi dega so that is the situation <laughs> वेंटिलेटर में चढ़ा के छोड़ दिया सर ना वो बेचारा इधर है ना उधर दैट्स दिस आल्सो व्हाट गुरु दुशन सेड आल्सो इज ब्रिंगिंग आउट अनदर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट अदि सिंस वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द डीप स्टेट यू सी दिस इज द सेकंड रीजन द प्रेजेंस ऑफ अ बिग पावर नियर बाय इन द प्रोक्सिमिटी दैट इज चाइना चाइना इज आल्सो इंजीनियरिंग ऑल इट्स एफर्ट्स टू कीप पाकिस्तान एज अ वीक स्टेट and only then it can derive benefits although it is stating the obvious but that also is an important reason to justify the existence of a deep state in pakistan interesting sir just dakar ji you know general dushan mentioned something about the nuclear weapons and that's something which is a big fear amongst everyone around the world that these these i mean i don't want to use the language but these rogue you know uh elements within the pakistani army as well as the militant organization that we see um could get in control of these nuclear weapons do you even foresee something like that happening because at the end of it uh, it is a clear given understanding that the deep state will not let as far as its power goes will not let that happen as much as possible but we both understand and we all understand there are still those rogue elements within the army who would you know want to do something extremely stupid do you think there is a fair possibility of something like that happening the question is absolutely relevant are they in uh, we are in 21st century and uh, cold war is over post cold war another cold war has begun the cause of concern is justified but let's try and understand you see nuclear uh, arsenal is not a one piece product as i understand i was trying to find a specific answers to your question uh, general dushan has been in special force uh, he has been nsg and dealt with these things he will be able to throw much more light but what i have come to uh, the conclusion is that one person he may give the executive order but that executive order has to be responded to by multiple agencies and each agency is actually preparing a component and all these components they are put together they assembled at a different place and then only it becomes viable or tenable for getting activated so therefore if you are suspecting that it will fall into the hands of non state actors or say taliban or say any other jihadi group there well um, initial uh, impression which i had gathered was same fear same apprehension but after having read through these uh, uh, material available with me i came to the conclusion maybe that a uh, layman uh, tends to fall into the trap of exaggeration it is not that simple it is not that easy to be operated successfully and uh, um, you know um, detonated at a place relevant a place or place of desire at a right time it's not that simple that is all general dushan will be able to throw some light is got uh, experience uh, in a higher domain so so yeah uh, if given the given the way pakistan army is it's a professional army and it will not allow any access to the nuclear arsenals i painted this picture when people say that pakistan will implode pakistan will become unstable pakistan will collapse i am saying in that eventuality pakistan collapses means what the pakistan army has lost control of it i am very clear in my articulation that pakistan is surviving because of the pakistan army so if if pakistan implodes or if pakistan destabilizes it means its pakistan army is unable to handle the situation so the so the condition which i give and in that case what happens is who takes the control of these will be a very very uh, vague uh, uh, outcome we don't know who will take control of these 
scary so, scenario the, so 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 the whole articulation of mine was on the on the premise that you know pakistan is in a very poor state it is going to explode it is going to implode um, the economy is falling inflation is raising rising high so what does it mean it means that the pakistan army has lost control that is why i say that they will rechristen rename use all kinds of force to ensure if they are not able to ca- control tehreek e taliban pakistan they will resort to the operations which they did in north western frontier about 5 years back they will use the pakistani army's might and control the talibanis pakistan army is not afghanistan defense forces they are an army trained initially by the british army like us i have i have i have operated with the pakistani brigadiers and major generals they think as good or as bad as are as us and they have the wherewithal and their uh, means to fight such groups mm-hmm. it is just that everybody wants to first explore political means to control these groups and that's why they had told afghanistan to uh, taliban afghanistan to get into talks with tehreek uh, taliban pakistan and try to tell them that look stop undertaking these attacks against the pakistan army <laughs> you will see you will see uh, pakistan army launching attacks against they are not going to keep quiet about it so the whole articulation of mine was on the fact that pakistan army has lost control of the country which is very very unlikely unlikely hmm. so general sudhakar ji sir i'd like to request you before i you know uh, request general dushant singh to close the discussion first may i request you to you know go ahead and give your closing comments well my closing comments are uh, a deep state in any state any nation state is not desirable in keeping with uh, uh, good global orders uh, some of the autocratic nations for example north korea north korea once upon a time used to have a very active and uh, deep rooted deep state but because of autocracy the um, leadership in north korea has managed to wipe it out completely so there is no shortcut for effective governance in a democratic form for to achieve or or attain a rules based international order in governance uh, and uh, address the the rights of the people and uh, aspiration of the people look after the, the the human rights needs of the women and the children and the girl child um also address multiple challenges which are emerging i think the time has come that the global order has to take a call there are not far many or too many nation states as pakistan pakistan is pakistan we know that it is the epicenter of terrorism why is us now uh, hesitating in blacklisting this country if cuba syria iran and north korea could be you know they they, they have already been blacklisted by us and the sanctions have been imposed on them uh, what, what, what do they expect pakistan to do a sovereign nation has raided into another sovereign nation and gone and imposed a governing party there the taliban is not taliban today my sources who i have in afghanistan are saying that a substantial quantum of pakistan regular forces in the garb of civil dress they are operating with taliban it's a occupation force today you check up the twitter Uh, Amrullah Salal has already tweeted a message that I have got solid evidence to prove the fact that Taliban is not Taliban; it is a pa- Pakistan-occupied army which is operating in Afghanistan. So, therefore, what I would say is that it needs to be routed; it needs to be addressed in a global level, uh, so that um, neither it exists in Pakistan nor any other state, nation state, gets a precedent. to carry it forward beyond the limit it should be uh, um, taken care of nice and properly once and for all that is all i have to say absolutely agree sir general dushan sir well uh, as far as uh, deep state is concerned uh, let me uh, let me uh, tell you very candidly that every nation has a deep state it is it is the way it is managed and by deep state i mean intelligence agencies basically if you manage your intelligence agencies uh, correctly then the situation what pakistan is facing won't come 
even arth shastra chanakya says that a nation which does not have its spy networks i think that nation is doomed to fail mm. right so every nation has a right to have a have a intelligence network intelligence uh, community intelligence structures pakistan has gone beyond that they have used this pakistan army has used this as an instrument of seeking power and as an instrument of creating trouble for the other countries it is these two factors which need to be addressed if we want to control deep state and this can only happen through a global effort through a a global isolation but not to the extent that pakistan uh, is pushed to a corner and it, it it takes an action which is an existential one you know attack on india or you know something of that nature which is of an extreme nature and which may actually result in major uh, major war and a major security situation which may threaten global peace and security so therefore it has to be done through uh, global effort as uh, 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 sudhakar said it has to be done through financial controls it has to be done in a very very balanced and moderate manner and uh, and the last one which i always say is that uh, if there is any country which has uh, a deep state or which has instruments as powerful as pakistan's isi or more powerful than that is the united states of america right so if they can enter osama uh, enter pakistan and kill osama bin laden with the help of human intelligence which was there in pakistan of these guys i think they can do uh, certain manipulations after all zia ul haq was eliminated so therefore that is i am referring to that as a as a kind of a it should not be mentioned but what i'm saying is if everything fails then we always have the other deep state to react to the deep state of pakistan that would be the last resort but the first one would be a global effort to to give some sense to pakistan to start acting responsibly at the international level in international forums look at global commons look at look at issues of interest look at look at water security look at environmental protection they have to be actually diverted from their excessive toxic nationalism which they are following toxic nationalism i think that is the biggest takeaway which is going to come out apart from you know the whole lot of points that has been brought about let uh, the choice of the deep state being there the nuclear weapons as james dakar ji explained and so many of these little little things that the pakistanis have been hiding around from the world it is so important for us to understand and know these factors because these are the guys that are actually running the country on our western front it's not the uh the imran khans of the world who you know and i'm going to take this in a very funny way if i may put it that way uh, the handsome prime minister uh, just next to a lot many more which are there but uh, it's it's basically a lot more than this today we see imran khan even frustrated with what is happening around him uh it is the deep state which is actually directing all sorts of trouble within india directing its assets within afghanistan and of course the region around the place uh, a lot of the inputs towards china are allegedly going from the deep state as well uh, there are certain officers that have been uh, there are reports of officers of this you know particular organization positioned with the chinese to try and influence their operations against india so it's something that we need to worry about it's not something uh, that we must take lightly because of the failing situation in pakistan and i think both the generals brought it out very clearly that the pakistanis or the pakistan as a state is not so easily uh, on its way to failure we can see bad reports we can see horrible protests but it's not going to implode so easily and if it does i think that's another thing that both of them have subtly hinted it's going to be big trouble for the region thank you general dushant and general sudhakar ji for having this conversation with me it's been an interesting uh, interaction and i'm looking forward for another subject another day till then sir jai hind thank you jai hind thank you thanks sir